it takes a long it takes a long time for me to to go through the file. So it, it essentially is the interface is given by let's say the imaginary part. So you can look at the imaginary part as either positive or or negative, and then you are trying to look at the interface between this uh, percolation. Uh, this just two color percolation. Okay. So should, so I start now. Good. Yes. Good. Uh, we are O five. Should, should I start O six or should I start O five? Like, I I cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it's O uh, five is okay. 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 So, so, so I can start if my time is not wrong. Good. So thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure to, to speak in this seminar. It's also, it's also a pleasure to do math in these uh, complicated times. So one can forget about the perils of reality. Uh, so I will uh, continue the talk about uh, uh, that, that Christophe did about our joint work. And I will speak a little bit more about what Christophe uh, hinted in the last part of his, uh, of his talk, which is uh, a special statistical reconstruction problem. Um, so, so the talk will, will have five parts. I, I will go a little bit fast in the introduction, given that Christophe gave a, a really nice overview of what are the questions we are looking at. But still, I would like to, that all of us, we are on the same page. Then I will um, discuss about uh, some, somehow um, the elephant on the room. What is the BKT phase transition for the Gaussian free field? And in the, phase, in the third and fourth part, I will discuss about somehow the proof in the low temperature and the high temperature regime. And finally, how this uh, new point of view about this uh, KT transition opened the door for, for some new questions and some new answers. Um, so before I will uh, start we we'll start with the Gaussian free field. So as Christophe said, well, this is a field that, uh, that takes values on, on a given graph and uh, inputs out, uh, outputs things that are real numbers. Um, and the it, it comes from a Gibbs measure and the probability of the, the, the associated energy is just the Dirichlet energy. So this, this would be satisfying, but I still somehow, you ask yourself what, why it is Gaussian. So, so this is, make, this is the easiest case to define the object. There is an alternative definition. You can think of the Gaussian free field. So, so if you understand the first definition, then, then you are good. But if, if you don't, and then you want an, an alternative one, you can think of the Gaussian free field as a Gaussian, as a center Gaussian process with covariance given by the Green's function. by x, by y. And then you say, well, what are the boundary conditions of this Green's function? We will define. And in, in this talk, we will always think that in the boundary of the field, as the bit that described Christoph, we are in fact zero. So directly boundary conditions, and this will be in all the talk. Okay. Um, so what is important to, to know about the Gaussian free field, it is, it is a Gaussian field. So essentially changing the inverse temperature just amounts to a multiplied by a, factor, by a constant factor. So in fact, qualitatively, the Gaussian free field looks the same at any temperature. And this can be seen, for example, that its variance is somehow linear with the temperature. So one can say immediately, well, it doesn't look like there is a phase transition as, you know, the, the change, the qualitative, there is no qualitative change for any given temperature. However, this is not the case for the integrated value Gaussian free field. So for the integrated value Gaussian free field, here we are representing in, in so lambda is, is the one dimension because we still do not have uh, such a nice images uh, in two dimensions. Uh, and what we are doing here is that we fixed, so we start at zero and then we, the only thing we have right to is take values in the integers. So we still have the same energy. So the energy is still the same, uh, directly, uh, yes, the same directly energy. However, the, the values it can take now they are in C. So for example, it, is, it now makes sense to say what is the probability of having exact psi. Yes. 
this just comes because we have a we have countably many of this side. Uh, and the Gaussian free field, as, uh, the, the integrated value Gaussian free field, as Christoph explained, it actually undergoes a phase transition. And uh, it's this uh, B, BKT phase transition, which says that if the temperature is, sorry, if the temperature is big enough, sorry, small enough, then it doesn't matter the size, so, so, sorry. I will explain. So we have a, a integrated value of Gaussian free field in a graph. So it's a big box. And I will put boundary condition zero, like always, on the outside. And the Gaussian free and then what I'm going to look at is what is the variance of this field in the center of the box. And what happens is that when the temperature is low enough, in fact, this, the variance does not depend on the size of the box. So it's bounded, it doesn't depend, uh, it doesn't matter how big the box is, the box is, the variance will, will remain bounded. However, this was shown by Frederick and Spencer in, in 81, when the temperature is uh, big enough, then in fact, uh, the Gaussian free field fluctuates as almost as good as a Gaussian free field. And, uh, so the, this, this second part is the, hard, is the hardest part to show because the first part, in fact, can be shown by a, uh, well, it's a, it's a non-trivial, but it's a still a payers argument. So let me give you another way of looking at this phase transition. So before we look at the phase transition in a way or with, a, with local observables, so we were just looking at phi zero, we are going to, we can also un, try to understand this phase transition in, by, via a global observable, which is the maximum of the, of the field. So if you take a Gaussian free field at low temperature, an integrate value Gaussian free field at low temperature, yes, so uh, Lubetsky, Martinelli, and Sly show, show that when the temperature is, is, is uh, small enough, then the maximum of the field really looks like the maximum of independent Gaussians, like any independent Gaussians, with a correction term. And this correction term is, is quite small. It's a log log n term. So you, you, you know that you are not independent, but it is not that far away from that, at least from the point of view of the maximum. However, Oh, sorry, I went twice. When the temperature is big enough. Yes, so uh, Berth, mm -hmm. sorry. So Berth showed recently that in fact, the maximum of the field behaves like the maximum of a, a constant times the maximum of the Gaussian free field. And uh, with Christoph, we showed that in fact, it cannot be exactly the maximum of a Gaussian free field, it's a little bit smaller, and this little bit smaller is measured by this f, which is, which is this exponentially decreasing function on one over. Uh, so now I finally speak about the, what, what we've been hinting all the, the, the time. So what is the big BKT phase transition for, for the Gaussian free field? So the first, as I have explained, and Christoph explained also many times, in fact, one cannot expect a classical phase transition in the sense that the Gaussian free field looks the same at all, uh, at, at all temperatures. It's just a, a constant, a changing constant. So when one has this type of, of, of questions, when one wants to find a new phenomenon on, an, on a, on a well-studied object, one needs to have a different question. So we, we need to ask a question that is not really linear. The question is the following. So imagine that you take a Gaussian free field, that, some, that, that you have a Gaussian free field phi at inverse temperature beta, but uh, somehow you cannot, the people do not tell you what is your Gaussian free field. They only tell you it's a complex exponential, or let's say it's a rational part. So they just tell you phi mod one. The question is, can you still recover and, and this is the key, the macroscopic information on phi. So of course you will not be able to recover point by point, but maybe you can, you can look at it and say, oh, I can see the whole picture, or maybe not. So, so this is important to explain is because, well, by itself, the fact that the Gaussian field has a phase transition 
is, is, is interesting. But also, this is conjectured to be close to a, to a VLAN model, at least when the temperature is small, when the temperature is uh, small enough. So I, I want to make uh, this question clearer. So let me explain this question in dimension one. So in dimension one, imagine that you have, you have a, a Gaussian free field and a one dimensional Gaussian free field. It's just a random walk with Gaussian increment. So you can see here, in, uh, to the left, we have our random walk. And to the right, we have a, a we have the random walk and we marked these red points, which is uh, the, the rational path. And the question is, well, if I erase the blue thing, the blue line, can I recover it just from looking? Just from looking, can I recover the whole picture or at least the macroscopic picture looking at the picture on the right? So, so what would be the idea? Let's say one, one would try to do the following. We say, okay, imagine that I just know the red points. If I just know the red points, then I know that the next point is either this one, it is, let's say, epsilon, or it's one plus epsilon, or it's two plus epsilon, or epsilon minus one, or whatever. I, these are all the only possibilities. And then again, so, so the first thing one can do is try to, to look at at, one, at the possibility with the less energy, or let's say the probability that is the most likely. So it's a, either we, we could try to look at the, we can call that the ground state, so the one with the minimum energy, or which is essentially the same, but with another language, in the language of statistics, we will call this, we can try to do the maximum likelihood estimate. So what is the maximum likelihood here? It could be, uh, connecting you to the closest one. I mean, it, this gives you less energy, so you would do here, 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 then everything is good. And then we have to be careful, we do not want to go up because this costs more than just going down. And then here we have another problem. This is clearly the closest. However, I mean, the real value, it, it lies up here. So as I show in this, uh, in this image, here we have the first problem and then we just continue. Yes, so, so this would be our uh, ground state or our maximum likelihood estimate. What happens is we see immediately clearly here that the problems are the places where the, Gauss, the Brownian motion jump more than one. And, and, this, the, and so we can recover everything except the places where the, Gaussian, the Brownian motion is jumping more than one. However, the points where the Brownian motion is, is jumping, the, sorry, the random walk is jumping more than one, they have positive density. So in fact, they will affect our, um, our guess and they will affect it in a macroscopic way. In a certain way, what I, what I say here is that imagine, one way to understand it, imagine this uh, random walk is converged into a Brownian motion B. Then, in fact, one will have that, that this approximate this, uh, this estimator will not be converging to the same Brownian motion. It's not possible, it doesn't matter what is the temperature, I will always have jumps of size more than one, and, and, and if, I want to, if I want to know what they are, I would essentially have to guess it, and this will reflect itself at, at the end. And then one can ask, well, the, the, the two-dimensional question is, 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 will be similar, so here I have an idea. You have, a, you, you have this uh, nice uh, shape in the right, and then you want to recover it on the left, and you want to recover it by its fractional part. Intuitively here, it is possible, it, is, it, should be, it should not be difficult to just recover this one just because of continuity. You know, you know that if you, if you go up a little bit, little by little, you, you have to complain to, co to complete your image. So, of course, continuity will help a lot, however, what is the problem? The Gaussian free field, of course, is, 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 in a, is, is, in a, is in a graph, so it is not continuous, so we cannot use that. However, there is a deep, even a deeper problem here, even it's a scaling limit. It's 
is not continuous. So, so this second this second part relates more with the uh, work that uh, Christoph uh, made reference about uh, of Aru and, and Junila, and, uh, which I will talk about a little bit at the end. However, this is a it's an important it's an important uh, property from from uh, from the abstract point of view, in the sense that uh, it, it means that there is something that we have to crack to get the the recovery function. Okay, so what is the, K, the BKT transition for the Gaussian free field? It is the following: Imagine that someone gives you the the, the fractional part of a Gaussian free field. Then they will they will see two, two thresholds. If the Gaussian free field it came from is cold enough, then in fact there will be a recovery function. And what this will recovery function do? It will say, okay, look at the point zero. So as before, we have a graph, we have a square. We look at, we look at the points with boundary condition zero. We look at the point in the center and we say, okay, what is my mistake? So I am making a mistake with recovery function, how big it is. And, and, and it is, and this mistake will not depend on the size of the graph. Uh, maybe this, this mistake does not depend on size of the graph. So I'm making essentially uniformly bad mistake, but this is of order one. However, if the temperature is big enough, then we will not be able to find any function of the of the fractional part that will recover the Gaussian field to an other one, so it, this it is also possible to show that this function will always be at least the mistake will be at, at least of order log n. So it doesn't matter which function I take; the best I can do is a, a constant times log n. So let me give you another point of view. So so this is Aurelio. Let me just uh, ask you a, a very simple question just to, to see if I'm following through. Uh, so other one in, in principle is the best possible because just one mistake gives you other one, no? Yes, so you cannot do better than other one. However, what I will discuss afterwards is, is in a way you can. I mean, the way you can do other one, it could be really bad in the sense that you could uh, add a, a constant to the whole field, for example. Yes, so I mean, you are, you are doing the fractional part, so you don't know if you are one plus or, or the other. And what I want to say is, in fact, you are not only recovering one point at a bad rate, you are in fact recovering everything at a good rate. So, so you can average, so this is a mistake that you can average it out. Yes. So this would be the, the point of view of the, the I mean, semi-classical point of view for, for this phase transition, the one I, the one I, I like the most, which is, uh, in fact, the new point of view, is, is a slight different, and it has it is related to the to the question of Milton. We do the same, but what we do is, in fact, that there is a so we will have that at low temperature, we will have a function that will approximate well the Gaussian free field. And in the other case, then there, there will be no function that does this property. So the key thing here is that this recovery function will not always not only approximate well the Gaussian field at one point, but it essentially will approximate the Gaussian field well at every point. And then, then the question is, uh, what does approximating well mean? So, so this is where my backgrounds come from. I, I usually like to work on the continuum. So we will we are going to be working in in the in a square minus one in in a square in the, in the complex plane. So the square will be fixed and our graph will be trying to approximate the square. So we will have a graph that is lambda epsilon equals, uh, so this is epsilon C2 intersected with minus one, one square. Yes, and what we will take is we will take a Gaussian free field pi epsilon on this grid. So, the, so of course, I'm always putting boundary condition zero in the boundary. Uh, so then if I have a Gaussian free field, a uh, five epsilon Gaussian free field in lambda epsilon, then this Gaussian free field is converging in law to something that is the continuum Gaussian free field, which I will not discuss, discuss that much. 
but essentially this this is this is not a continuum function this is a generalized distribution so it is a trust a generalized sorry a generalized function is a trust distribution and why do we want this we want this because it tells us what are the observables so the, the, the good observables we want to look at is the approximation of the integral of phi epsilon against continuum against a smooth function f. So this approximation here corresponds to this sum over here. And we will say, so, so the fact that it's converging, it means that all of these application against continuous functions, they are also converging. And um, so what will be a good approximation? A good approximation will be something that test it against function f. So if I do the integral of phi epsilon minus big F against a small f, this will go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. In another way, imagine that you have that your discrete Gaussian free field is converging to a continuum one. Then our recovery function will be converging to the same Gaussian free field. So in fact, the recovery function is really getting all the macroscopic information that is interesting for us in the Gaussian free field. And, and this is essentially equivalent to a good approximation. So in fact, this says that we can recover the macroscopic Gaussian free field if the temperature is low enough, but it is not possible to recover it, the macroscopic observables, when the temperature is, is large. Uh, so good. So now my, the objective is to give you an idea of how to find this recovery function. How do you get it? Uh, and a, a basic idea of the proof. So the first question is, well, what, what we can take as a recovery function? And, and the first intu intuition, as, as we discussed before, would be let, let's take the maximum likelihood. So let's take the ground state, the, the state with the less energy. Yes, so it's, it's like taking, so imagine that you have uh, that phi, that someone gives you phi mod one is equal to, let's say, A. Then you will look at all possible phi tilde such that they are equal to A mod one. Yes, and, and then you will look at the one with the least energy, the energy of phi, the lowest energy. So, so this would be a, a, a good guess. However, we do not know how to treat it. You, you don't only need to get in phi, approximate this phi tilde, but also estimate the entropy of things that are around this phi tilde. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe the, mini, the minimizer is really far away from where all your points are. And, and we will see that, that this may be the case for some, for some choices of A, at least for, for informally. So we, we use another thing, we say, okay, we will going to take the conditional expectation. So how do we define our recovery function at a given point B? What we will do is we say, okay, we condition on its complex exponential and we will average it out the remaining, um, the remaining randomness. And uh, the question itself is uh, why is this better? Why is the second one better at least for us than the, is this the other way? Yeah? It's better. So it's, okay. Why is the second one better than the first one? And uh, I will explain the reason just now. So the main idea is that imagine that you want to compute the mean error between uh, what you have and, and phi and the real value. The thing about, the nice thing about this is that this in fact becomes a conditional variance. Well, if you, if, if you take an additional conditional expectation, but this is, this essentially represents a conditional variance. And, uh, and there is a nice thing about variances. So imagine that you want to compute the variance of X. However, as, as in our case, it is not really easy in this case to guess what is the expected value of X. You just have the variance. So what you do is you say, okay, I will, uh, I will, I don't want to compute the variance. What I will do is compute I will compute the expected value of the difference of two x 
where x1 is independent of x2, and they have the law of x. So I make two independent copies of x, I subtract one to the other, and with that way I get the variance. And here, because we have a conditional variance, we have to do the conditional version of this story. We sample this phi1 and this phi2 that are here in the following way. We first sample a, a Gaussian free field, and it's, a, and it's a complex exponential. And given this information, we, phi1 and phi2 are going to be uh, independent, so they are conditionally independent. And the law of phi1 yes, is equal to a Gaussian free field with inverse temperature beta, condition on having its conditional, its, its uh, fractional path being equal to that of the original Gaussian free field. So, so, this this, so this conditional expectation is not that difficult to understand. So the only thing you do is you say, okay, what is the probability of, of a given phi given uh, the conditional expectation of the Gaussian free, the, sorry, given the fractional path of, uh, of it being equal to theta, well, this is, has the same energy as before. However, you are only going to sum on the ones that you like, on the phi that, that look nice. Uh, and what is the nice thing about doing this? The nice thing is that, well, phi one and phi two have a, phi one and phi two have a complicated law when the joint law is really complicated, it's not easy. However, the marginal law is easy. The marginal law is that of a Gaussian free field. And this is the only input we are going to use. We are going to use that the phi one and phi two are coupled in such a way that their law, the marginal law is equal to the Gaussian free field. Goes that way. Uh, and then what we want to do now is a previous argument. So what we are going to do is that we are going to color blue all of the points where phi one where phi one is equal to phi two. And we are going to color red all the points where they are different. And uh, before I start coloring, of course, well, I get for free the boundary conditions. Both of them have to, be, have, to have boundary conditions zero, so th that's for free. And at this point, what we are going to be interested in is what should happen in the center for them not to be equal. We want to show that in the center, they are really likely to be equal. And uh, what we do is the following. So we take the coloring. You, you have a, a even coloring, and we see that the point in the center was, was red. We ask ourselves why. And the answer is it has to do with, a, with, a, with an interface. So there is this uh, purple interface here that has the, the following property. To the right of this uh, interface, I have always blue points. And to the left of the purple interface, I, also, I always have just red. So what does this mean? It has, we have to have an interface such that Five, so they are equal to the right and they are different to the left. And this can only happen if either phi one or phi two made a jump bigger than one half in the edge crossing here. So let's say in this uh, green edge. So on all of the green edges, there has to be a jump of at least one of them of, that is bigger than one half. So, so now how do we formalize the argument quite quickly? So we need to show that any fixed contour has a probability that is exponentially unlikely on the length of the, of the contour and that, it in, that the constant increases, uh, increases with beta. And we do this in two steps. The first one is we study a Gaussian free field. Yes, we fix a set of edges E, so it doesn't have to be contiguous, whatever. And we ask ourselves how unlikely it is that in all of this set, the Gaussian free field makes a jump bigger than one half. And, uh, and this is exponential. So when the temp when beta is, uh, when temperature is low enough, so when beta is high enough, this is exponentially unlikely in the same variables that we wanted before. So a, a short, a, so I will not do the proof of this and just a short idea for people who are familiar with the Gaussian free field. 
what you use here is that you use the Macro property of the Gaussian free field. You, you take the conditional expectation given the values of all of the vertices that uh, may part of some edge. And uh, what you see is that one, the, this conditional expectation is just a projection of a Gaussian vector. So in fact, it's, it's directly energy. It, it's a chi, it's a, a chi square to, uh, so, so maybe the i is not necessary. So it's a chi square with a, with a, with a degrees of freedoms proportionally to the amount of edges. And what we are asking is that this uh, chi, chi square is, is really, really big. Uh, and this is exponentially unlikely. So, well, if, if you didn't understand that, it's, it's not important. What we know is that it is exponentially unlikely to have that many edges for, for any fixed set of edges. It's exponentially unlikely to have that many edges uh, with, the, with a given Gaussian free field is bigger than one half. And then we use the fact that we saw before. We saw that if we had a contour gamma, then at least gamma divided by two edges, we have that either phi one or phi two, let's say, imagine phi one, so in at least uh, cardinal of gamma divided by two edges, phi one is big, has increment that is bigger than one half. So when one has this, plus the fact that phi one has the law of a Gaussian free field, with the one above plus a small combinatorial argument, one in fact gets that the result that we needed, this is the result on the top. So in fact, uh, so, so this is a, a quite a nice argument because we are not fixing our, our ran uh, the randomness coming from theta. So the, we are averaging out on, on the randomness coming from theta. So it would, what, it's what we call an annealed Bayer's argument. We, at, up to this point, we do not know, at this, this point, if what we are getting is we are getting really nice thetas and this allows us to obtain the fact that you can recover the Gaussian free field, or it doesn't matter what thetas you are getting. In fact, our field is localizing quite well for any possible theta. So we are going to discuss a little bit what is the what happens and why this is not such a straightforward. So the argument is an yield, and it is pretty important that this an. So now, given the, the discussion I had before, I will discuss what is the chipped Gaussian free field. Which, uh, which essentially will be, so this is a, as always I have up to, in all of this talk, except in the Villa model, we always have the same energy of, of the give measure. The only thing we are changing is the possible values we have. So what we do is that we will take a, a, a function that gives numbers between zero and one, and we will ask that phi, and we will only measure size such that psi minus a is, is an integer, meaning I only measure psi, my only possible outcomes are psi such that they are equal to a in the fractional path. Yes, so we have got two examples up to the moment. So if a is equal to zero, sorry, this is an integer value, integer value Gaussian free field. So this we, we somehow understand well. So there is a second one we understand. So we can also take a random, of course. So, so here a is fixed, it's deterministic, but I could take a random. So if I take a equal to a Gaussian free field mod one, modulo one, then in fact, so I, don't, I do not know much about the, uh, the quench law of phi, but I know about the anil law, and the anil law is just a Gaussian free field. So one has both phenomenon. Either, however, in this case, we are going to work with a general. So let me show it to you what means, let's say, in the one dimensional case. So here, this is zero, this is one, and the red is my a. And, uh, as, and a one dimensional Gaussian free field here would take any possible values in, in, this, in this blue dot. So meaning, for example, it could be this, this, then I can make a jump of minus four. And yes, so, so it is the same as, it's a little bit the, the, the same object that looks when we were trying to recover the Gaussian free field given A. 
And uh, so before going with the results, I think it's, imp it's important to understand this, uh, this model is to understand the enemies. So at the beginning, what would say, well, we understand what's going on when A is equal to zero, every A should behave essentially similar. And what I want to show you is there are some enemies. So these enemies, the following, I am using the same uh, color scheme that we stop use uh, for the XY model. So blue means zero. And this uh, orange, well, at least for me, is orange means uh, one, a uh, one half. So this is the boundary condition, and we are going to work in really low temperature. So in really low temperature, we expect that all of the things that are connected take exactly the same value, like this. The same color, and they are connected. If, if my temperature is zero, they will take essentially the same value. So let me look at what. Uh, let let me make a comment about what will go on in. Uh, in the midpoint, so here, so, so I, will draw, I will draw it down here. So the first step, I know that my uh, fractional path is equal to one half. So I start at zero, this is because it's boundary condition. And I know that in the mid step, I have to go to one half. But this could be the plus one half or minus one half. I mean, there is no preference on what should I go. So essentially I got to plus one half or minus one half. And then when I am one half, so of course I will go to three halves, but this would come in much more, much more energy or, or to five halves. And then I go again and I can either come back to zero or go to one. And what I will essentially do is I will do a random walk at really, really low temperature. And because all of these random walks are, um, are, a, possible, uh, are a possible ground state, in fact, we will have that in this distribution, the, um, the value at the zero, at value at zero has mean zero. However, its variance is really, really big. Even though beta, even though the, the even though the temperature is re, is really, really low, in fact, the variance explodes. So one cannot hope uh, the discussion about one cannot hope, for example, to say, well, it doesn't matter which values the Gaussian free field modulo one give me. I will be able to say that, my, that my, I can recover my field. This is not true. For this one, we cannot recover. Let me show you another enemy, which is essentially uh, one where the variance is where the mean is exploding, not the variance. So, so in this case, as before, the Gaussian, the blue is zero, yellow is one third, and white is one two thirds. And in this case, what what goes through? Is that in fact, well, I start on zero before, but then if my temperature is really, really low, I in fact want to go more to one third than to two, minus two thirds. So I will go up by one third, and then I will uh, go out by one third again. And the, at low temperature, in fact, the mean of this will, will grow uh, linear with n. So it's not, it, it will be a, con a constant times n. Yes. So, uh, so this is for when the temperature is really low. And uh, the interesting question about this uh, model, either we, we believe that when the temperature is big enough, uh, in fact, this model has a less, uh, has a, uh, doesn't have enough variance. So it, it really, uh, it really uh, get itself close to its mean. And uh, for them, no. So the question is, well, what's going on with beta is small? Is it not clear? Is it, this will behave like a Brownian it, this is behave like a Gaussian free field or it will essentially keep this expected value. So there are a lot of questions about a general A's, which are not clear. However, when temperature is big enough, somehow one believes that there is some kind of uh, more universal behavior. So low temperature is, is tricky. This is why it was important, the annealed argument. However, for, big temp for, for high temperature, what we show with Christoph is that one at least can say that the variance of the fields so the expected value may be quite tricky, but the variance of the field is almost that of a Gaussian free field. Yes. So we do not know. We do not have an upper bound. We we do not say at least it, it doesn't move more than a Gaussian free field, but it will at least move as a Gaussian free field. And okay. So so there are two remarks I want to make, and I forgot to make the first one. So the first one is that essentially this allows us to say the non-measurability statement. So the non-recovery statement. Sorry. So I cannot recover. And why is that? It is because phi one, phi one, and when the variance is big, modulo certain um, certain moment conditions. That means that phi one 
and uh, phi is far from phi two. So I, I, I do my my two Gaussian prefields that are conditionally independent given theta, and they have equal uh, fractional path. And in fact, typically they are quite far apart. And how far? They are square root log n up far. So it's not possible to have one function that gets close to both. So I can never recover. If I can recover phi one, I should be able to recover phi two. So I cannot. Yeah. The second one is that this is fun because this is a, this is a quench result. So for any A, I have at least this amount of, of variance, which means that they, that in particular for, for a nice model, which is the random phase Gaussian free field, which means that A is a, a IID on zero one. So if I have a independent random variable, so, so my face is in, my face is independent, my fraction of pi is independent. Essentially, you know that at high temperature, at least I have a variance as the Gaussian free field. And, and this model is quite nice because it is believed to behave as the Gaussian free field for high temperature. However, and counterintuitively for low temperature, it is expected that the expected value of the value at zero of this spin of the, of the variance at zero, this is equal to log, so it's up to a constant multiplicative constant uh, to log n squared. So, so in fact, it, it looks at low temperature is like uh, the other model at low temperature, it tends to fluctuate more than what it does at, at high temperature. So I hurry up. Okay, so let me give some comments about the proof. So what we do is to gen we generalize the proof of Florian and Spencer. Uh, so the proof of Florian and Spencer in a, in a part it uses strongly the fact that you have equality in law of pi with minus five. So for integral value Gaussian free field, you have this symmetry of equality in law. So I mentioned Bert here because he also made a generalization of Florian and Spencer for this elliptic model, but for a special shift of A, where he could essentially also add some some symmetries. However. For our case, it was impossible to circumvent the symmetries. So the lack of symmetry is, is a feature of the model. It's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And the way we do it is, um, is that we start with going with the proof of Prolich and Spencer until we really, really need to have the, the symmetry. And in that case, we have already an inequality of, of certain um, Laplace transform. So with these inequalities, what we do is we do, that, uh, we do some kind of Taylor expansion. At that first order, when we look at the Taylor expansion at first order, we essentially, it allows us to obtain explicit formula for the mean. So it is a complicated formula. It's not a formula that I can easily write in, in here. However, what this formula does, it has, from an, this inequality, we obtain exactly an equality, and it allows us to go to the second uh, order Taylor expansion. And from the second only order Taylor expansion, we obtain the um, we obtain the inequality of, uh, of the variance instead of just as of them. Okay. Uh, so this is what I want to say about our results. And now I want to talk about the new directions that this new point of view takes us. So so there's it, it opens some doors. Uh, the main thing about this is that it adds to the uh, let's say KT, BKT universality class, uh, uh, object that is really integrable. So the Gaussian free field itself, it's, it's a Gaussian process. You can compute everything you want with it. And there has been really a lot of work, recent, work recently in, in the recent 20 years to understand its geometric properties. So we have a lot of work already done on a model that from this point of view, it actually belongs to the uh, K, KT phase transition class, whatever that means. And in fact, thanks to that, in fact, it, it's possible to compute bounds on the critical on, on the on the critical recovery temperature. So the plus should be on up. So just so this is the paper that uh, Johan and Johan Aru and, and, and Jenny Junila uh, they uploaded today to the archive. So so this is uh, today. It's always nice to have to, to speak about recent math. So so what they show, in fact, is they show that. They study the continuum of this question. So, if you have the continu a continuum Gaussian free field and you have exponential of, so it's uh, it's a weak exponential. The question is whether you can recover the Gaussian free field. And they show that in the continuum you can always do it. 
However, the continuum, this is not always defined and it's, always, and it's only defined exactly as to this B critical. And what we show with Christophe in our paper is that this condition is enough, in fact, so if you, if you can recover the object from the continuum, then of course you, can, you have less information on the continuum than in the discrete. So in fact, you can also recover it in the discrete. So this gives us a, a direct bound. And uh, because of the, of the works of level lines of, of the Gaussian free field, we also believe that it is possible to, at least we conjecture a lower, a lower bound that is uh, one half of, of, of the original upper bound, and which has to do with the, with the so-called uh, uh, height gap of, of, of the Gaussian free field. It is fact that the gap, because the Gaussian free field is not continuum, there is, a, there is a minimum value that you have to go to cross interfaces. But this is, this is not proven. So the first one is proven, and essentially it is proven today. But the second one is still an open question. But, the, but the, this is the nice thing about working with the Gaussian free field. It allows us to use results known before to obtain, to obtain or at least to conjecture new results about KT transitions. So the second one is, uh, is as we say, we recall that we said that uh, we, uh, we believe that exponential of I times a Gaussian free field is close to a VLAN model. To a VLAN model. And then one says, well, one wants to see macroscopic structures on VLAN model. So this was related to the question. So we prepare a VLAN model that has a certain boundary condition to the right, which is positive image with, with positive imaginary path and with negative imaginary path to the left. And what I will do here is that I will look at a, I will look at the interface separating negative imaginary paths. So here the imaginary path is negative and to the right the imaginary path is positive. And uh, what we believe is that this is a macroscopic line, an interesting macroscopic line. Uh, so what we prove, so this line should be related to the same story for the Gaussian free field, to essentially the Gaussian free field being positive or Gaussian free field being negative. This is an SLE4 type level, SLE4 type line. And what we show with Christoph is that if you have exponential of i phi with a certain boundary conditions, you can in fact recover this SLE4 type line. So this is something you can actually see at low temperature, of course, not at high, but at, at low temperature, you can in fact recover this uh, level line. What we do not know up to the moment, if it, this level line can be recovered exactly with this algorithm. We believe it is true, but we, we were not able to prove it. Yes. So we know that it's recoverable. There's a function that recovers it, but we don't know which one, and we don't know if it's exactly local. Okay. Uh, to to finish, I would like to discuss a, a little bit, just just shortly, about the higher dimensional questions. So in dimension three, the integer value Gaussian free field and the Milan model they actually do not have KT transitions. So at least from the point of view of recovery, we would not expect that there is a, a phase tra a, a transition in the recovery of, of, of the four dimension, the three dimensional Gaussian free field. For four, four dimension, it's, it's a little bit tricky because the Gaussian free field, so, so this relates to an ongoing, to a work in progress with this stuff. So the Gaussian free field in, in, in dimension four, it's related, or at least the integer value Gaussian free field, it's related with the abelian young mills model that Christophe uh, touched. But in fact, one, one doesn't have in this case exactly an integer value Gaussian free field. But it's an integer value Gaussian free field that lives in a subspace of, of the domain. So it's, you cannot take it's certain, uh, it's, it looks like a certain projection of an integer value Gaussian free field, but the integer value part does not lend itself well to, to the projections. And uh, in a uh, work in, in progress, what we are trying to do, okay, so you should have finished it. So the question is, uh, in fact, we believe that, uh, that there is a statistical reconstruction. So there is a statistical reconstruction phase transition for the Gaussian free field, but of course, uh, given its complex exponential, but of course for the right, right macroscopic. Observables. Okay, I think I am, I am good on time. So this is what I wanted to tell you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, thank you very much Abel, for the for your talk. Uh, so let's see if uh, 
So now people can um, raise their hand if they want to make some questions and uh, also can make a, they can write in, in the chat if they want to. Yes, so. I, I, I am not seeing the chat because I'm, ah, here I can see it. I'm not intelligent enough with Zoom. So, I, so well, anyway, I can tell you that I can, I can read that uh, the question here. Yes. There's a question here. Can you elaborate on what one means by no KT transition? Is there some other phase transition? Uh, well, no. Uh, so, so <laughs> it is always dangerous to say there is no phase transition because <laughs> there is always uh, maybe something one can look and, and, and we saw in this talk that maybe traditional phase transition doesn't exist. But we do not believe that, it's, that there is a point where you cannot recover the Gaussian free field in a certain way. So this is, this is just... Um, Let's say it's, it's, it's just uh, what we expect. We have, because what happens in, in dimension three for the Gaussian free field, it's always uh, is, uh, super, is super critical. So it's subcritical for the free field, meaning that you, your correlations are always exponentially decreasing from the point of view of the integer value. So, we want to, so when one tra translate this to a uh, measurability, one, one would believe that you have measurability, it doesn't matter the temperature. So in that way, we believe that there is no phase transition. So I do have a question for you. Um, this uh, this phase transition that you observe in the in the, in the reconstruction of the EFF should it be um, should one observe it for other uh, low correlated fields? Yeah, I believe I believe it is true. So, for example, the con so so it, it it depends on what what is your discrete model. But in the continuum model, of the what they what uh, Jane and Johan show is that if if your if your correlations are, are smooth enough, so you have to you have to not add uh, let's say a constant a, a constant times uh, type of value in a certain part of the field. But if your correlations are nice enough then uh, in fact, uh, you can recover the Gaussian free field given its complex exponential. However, of course, this only works on the case where the complex exponential is defined on the continuum. Where essentially, the correlations make sense. And uh, one, one would expect that the same thing is true, in fact, in, in, the, in, in dimension two in the discrete. Right. And what about, uh, for example, uh, if you put a log correlated field in the dimension three? Yes, so then one would expect that there is, so the local related field, so in dimension three, there is recovery. So this is what uh, is shown by, in the same paper by, by, uh, by uh, Johan and, and Janne. However, so this is in the continuum. So one would expect at least that at low temperature regimes that there is recovery. So this, this always work, low temperature. So the question is high temperature. Yes, so in a way, low temperature will essentially be a still pay as argument. And um, so another thing that I was wondering about is that, um, okay, let me see. Uh, so there's a question by Nathanael that maybe it's, it's, it's a nice one. So is it true that the integer value Gaussian free field has localization transition? And if so, do you conjecture this is the same as the reconstruction transition? Uh, well, uh, it's, a, it's a nice question. So, so the, the integer value Gaussian free field does have a, a localization transition? Uh, and this was the one of the big motivations to start this project was try to understand essentially this object, but from a more integrable one. And the more integrable one we found was the Gaussian free field. So, so we still have a discussion with Christoph about what do we believe about this. So we, we made no conjectures on the paper. I am always more uh, optimistic than than Christoph. Let's say it that way. I, I always believe that everything is is easy, but. Uh, well, in this, it doesn't look easy to prove that they are the same transition. It maybe looks, uh, it is maybe, maybe it will be easier to show that both of them agree by showing it in, in each case. But uh, yeah, no. so I, I will not, uh, after that, the comments on that, I would say I will not comment on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Well, here is where the left usually um, open the um, the microphone for everybody to everybody to uh, clap their hands. This is something I don't really know how to do. Okay, let's do uh, that. Uh, 
Okay. So, okay. So, 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 so